Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Nature City Podcast. I'm your host, Carl Pradelli, and I'm also the CEO and co-founder, along with my wife, Beth. We started Nature City almost 20 years ago, and it's been our privilege to serve about 500,000 Americans in that time by giving them the best products we can make. Today, I'm really happy you tuned in because we have a special episode. We're going to be talking about a nutrient that's one of the most powerful antioxidants in nature. And yet, most people I speak to have not yet heard of it. In addition, it's really a challenge to get enough of it from diet alone, which makes it a perfect candidate for use as a supplement. It's called astaxanthin. And today, you're not going to just be hearing from me. We're going to be joined by Dr. Karen Hecht, who is the Scientific Affairs Manager at Astoreal in the United States. Astoreal, in addition to being the premier producer of astaxanthin, really was the company that, in my mind, did the most to put astaxanthin on the map, making substantial investments over the last 30 years in research that really have validated a lot of the benefits that we're going to be talking about today. In addition, you know, it's a real treat personally to have Karen join us because, in my mind, when it comes to depth of knowledge about the science of astaxanthin, she has to be top five in the country, if not, we'll say top ten, just to be safe. But she's certainly number one in my book. So, Karen, it's great to see you. Thank you for making time for us today. Thank you, Carl. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here to speak with you today and to educate your audience on astaxanthin. I know we've partnered for quite a long time, so it's always a pleasure to support um, Nature City. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yes, and it has been 10 years. Mm -hmm. So here's how I think we should start. Um, I know you have have a PhD in molecular biology. You have a degree in biochemistry. You're an accomplished scientist, could be doing a lot of different things. <laughs> what led you to astaxanthin? What, you know, and why, you know, what's, what's unique about astaxanthin that you decided to dedicate, what I think it's probably the last six, seven years of your career, to working with Astoreal? Well, the first thing that drew me to biology in the first place was the connections that you can make. Um, you know, there are certain principles in nature that are applied really widely. And that's what I really always loved about the subjects that I studied. You know, biochemistry helps to explain so much about how the entire organism works and functions. We understand, you know, how the body is a system that works together. And I often try to draw this parallel of, you know, we we think about cognition separately from eye health or skin health, but really, you know, the Pacific Ocean is not separated from the Atlantic and all the oceans oceans are connected and similarly our bodies do the same thing right all of these tissues Absolutely. are connected and so I love this um, more holistic whole body approach um, that I got to learn as a biochemistry student and uh, then what happened was I ended up uh, really interested in lipid biochemistry specifically mm-hmm. uh, lipids are such um, you know underrated <laughs> uh, biochemical molecules I think uh, Proteins are re- and DNA tends to, tend to be the stars in biochemistry because they're the the doers and the the computers, the blueprints. But lipids are really structurally important, and we we've learned also that they're involved in signaling and in helping cells keep their shape and in in energy. You know, they're mm-hmm. substrates for energy production. So there's actually a lot of different kinds of lipids and ways to support them. We know they're really important in our diet and helping our brain function. And so uh, it also turns out that lipids are some of the most sensitive to oxidative damage. And uh, having an antioxidant that's especially effective at protecting lipids just um, triggered a curiosity in me initially. And I was working with algae, another uh, passion or area of interest of mine, because algae are just such amazing organisms that can be really used for are. so many things. They could be used to make lipids, algal oils, they could be used to make biofuels. And when I was working as a postdoctoral associate, I was using a different kind of algae to make biomaterials out of mm-hmm. silica shells that certain uh, algae called diatoms uh, make. Mm-hmm. And so I was already into, you know, lipid biochemistry and the, the wonderful machine 
machines that algae can be. And I, I came across this algae that makes astaxanthin that helps to protect lipids. So for me, that was just instantly bringing, you know, two, two worlds and two interests together with a chance to really help people um, and a chance to really communicate the science, uh, which was the, the job I, you know, I, I still have with Astreal today. So helping to make all that wonderful science more accessible to people so that they can leverage it and benefit from it. Um, that's really where my passion lies. Now it makes total sense. And look, when you talk about protecting lipids, um, from antioxidant, you know, as an antioxidant from free radical activity, I mean, Astaxanthin is pretty off the charts in that regard, is it not? Yes, it is one of nature's most powerful known antioxidants. So it is uh, when we do a head-to-head -head comparison in a test tube of all sorts of different antioxidants and how excellent are they at quenching a, a certain type of free radical called singlet oxygen. Well, in that kind of head-to-head -head comparison, we found that natural astaxanthin is 6,000 times more powerful than vitamin C and 800 times more powerful than CoQ10 and even two to five times more powerful than other carotenoids, which is the, the family of antioxidants that astaxanthin belongs to. It's a, it's a carotenoid pigment, uh, and it's red in color. So very, very powerful uh, antioxidant capacity, which, of course, makes it have such great potential for, for health benefits as a dietary antioxidant. Exactly. So what's interesting to me um, is, yes, there was that study with the singlet oxygen kind of free, type of free radical and just you know maybe we should before we get too far into this we should just define what a free radical is very quickly and why too many of them could be detrimental to our health yes so free radicals are very unstable and reactive molecules often because they have this unpaired electrons and electrons don't like to be generally by themselves they like to be you know coupled up with a partner electron so when an electron finds itself all alone <laughs> It, uh, it quickly tries to find another partner wherever it can. So that free radical is not stable and not happy energetically with where it's at. And it's going to be grabbing, trying to grab an electron or a hydrogen atom from anywhere, whatever's closest by. And it's indiscriminate. Uh, it'll take any, any unwilling donor, such as DNA, protein, lipids, carbohydrates, whatever's around. And so what we often can think of when we think of free radicals is uh, oxidative damage and it's mm -hmm. often a free uh, like um, a, a, a chain reaction of oxidative damage so when a free radical takes an electron say from a nearby molecule that may now destabilize that donor which leads that donor to look for an unpaired electron and so you can quickly get unstable molecules forming across centimeters of tissue even though you started maybe with one little free radical in one spot Exactly. And look, I mean, some of this free radical activity is very normal and necessary in our bodies, right? But it's when, that's, when the system gets overwhelmed and there's too much damage being caused to cells or tissues or organs is where we have a problem. That's where antioxidants really come in, correct? To exactly. really help manage and balance that. Yeah, that's a that, good point. A, a free radicals uh, alone by themselves, they're not bad uh, and they are useful in many, many uh, functions like immune function or exercise adaptation. What we're talking about is oxidative stress and oxidative damage. So that's what we want to avoid. So oxidative stress happens when the free radical load really overwhelms our body's own endogenous antioxidant capacity. So when you have more free radicals than you can handle, uh, that uh, the damage accumulates and that's what's leading to this oxidative stress. And antioxidants have this unique ability to stabilize uh, free radicals. So they act as, as donors, willing donors of, uh, a, 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 of an electron to these free radicals, helping to stabilize them and sort of quench uh, that that reaction so right and what's interesting one of the things i got interested you know one of the reasons i got interested in astaxanthin was not only can it help with those um singlet oxygen free radicals it really helps neutralize a lot of the other 
classes of antioxidants, which could be pro problematic. I think there's hydroxyl, peroxyl. We don't have to go through all of them. But that's not necessarily the case with all antioxidants. Is that right? Yeah, I would love that you brought this up because, you know, we're not saying, I don't think that astaxanthin can replace every antioxidant because every antioxidant has its own personality, its own types of free radicals that it's very good at quenching or places in the body where it tends to function best. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yes, astaxanthin is especially good at singlet oxygen and super superoxide anions, but, uh, uh, but it also, you're right, quenches uh, peroxyl radicals and other types of uh, lipid-based, you know, free radicals or reactive lipids. So it's it's got a, a versatile uh, portfolio, for mm -hmm. sure. It also uh, helps to protect membranes because it itself is found in membranes. It's a fat-soluble antioxidant in contrast, say, to vitamin C, which is a water-soluble antioxidant and can't access membranes. And... Um, you know, what was that, what else was I going to say about astaxanthin? Um, well, one thing that you know, one thing that I thought on picking up on that theme of versatility, mm -hmm. and you kind of touched on it a bit, but just want to make sure our, our our viewers and listeners capture this is, you know, astaxanthin has again somewhat unique ability to work on both the outer part of the cell membranes as well as the inner portions of the cell membranes. As an example, vitamin C and vitamin E, probably two best known and two of the most important antioxidants, right, in our bodies. I think it's vitamin C can work on the outside, the more water soluble part, and vitamin E, I think, can work on the inner portion, but astaxanthin can, can play in both places. Is that correct? Right. So it's to do with the structure of astaxanthin. So vitamin C is water soluble. So it accesses the aqueous parts of the cell. And if you think of the cell like a water balloon, you know, the balloon part is the membrane and then inside and outside is an aqueous environment where vitamin C likes to live. But what if you, you know, what if a free radical punches a hole in the balloon itself in the membrane, you know, things aren't going to go well. And so you right. do need some kind of antioxidant that's going to specialize in protecting that membrane and astaxanthin can do that and vitamin e can do that too they're both fat soluble antioxidants but vitamin e is rather short and astaxanthin is just the right length to span the full thickness of the membrane and so that's why uh, what you mentioned is true that it's able to quench free radicals both inside the membrane and on both sides of the membrane periphery because it kind of fits coaxially to sort of bridge the entire thickness of the membrane. Right. And which makes, you know, which is, it's just a sheer power, but also this versatility that, you know, I think really makes it really important, you know, to get through diet and, and, and hopefully, and supplements too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny, uh, you know, I always like, I always referred, uh, I think it was Dr. Lester Packer, who's like one of the, you know, antioxidant, you know, um, Sometimes referring to his doctor antioxidant, I guess, who always like said, you know, antioxidants work best with each other, not in singularly, if you will. Yes. You know, almost think of it as a network versus. So again, we're not saying ignore all these other antioxidants; they all are important. But in particular, astaxanthin has this really because it's so versatile and so powerful, it can do a lot of things in the body to really help you that maybe without it we wouldn't see so that, you know that's that's really what you know want to make sure we're getting across you agree with that sentiment i agree i think astaxanthin is a powerful tool in your dietary antioxidant toolkit and not just dietary antioxidants we have our own endogenous antioxidants as well that our body produces like glutathione and superoxide dismutase and astaxanthin in addition to being a direct antioxidant, meaning that it directly quenches free radicals, it also actually increases expression of endogenous free radicals like glutathione and superoxide dismutase. And so we've seen in a study that at baseline, in one clinical study of a group of young healthy men, their baseline levels of glutathione increased by 7% just from supplementation with astaxanthin. 
Well, you just taught me something. I had not heard that. It really supports the endogenous antioxidant system. So uh, that's really, well, I like astaxanthin even more. Let's keep going. Right? <laughs> so, there you go. So, so they work um, together. So that's what, you know, diversified portfolio and the dietary antioxidants are a backup because that endogenous antioxidant system does become less efficient as we age, which means we're more likely to experience oxidative stress as we age. And so those dietary antioxidants come in to compensate for any any anything that's missing or that the endogenous antioxidants may not be able to uh, keep up with. Absolutely. So we so we identified astaxanthin as one of the most powerful antioxidants found in nature. Where is it found in nature, and you know how do we get it? From, how do we how do we how do we get it through diet? Yeah, so it's actually found. It's quite prevalent in nature, just not so prevalent in the foods we eat. So in okay. nature, there's a number of microorganisms that produce astaxanthin, both marine organisms and freshwater organisms. There's even um, soil and, and, and snow uh, type of microorganisms and algae that produce astaxanthin. Among animals, uh, often when you see the color pink or orange or red, uh, you can bet that astaxanthin has something to do with that. So flamingos, for example, have their distinctive color because astaxanthin is one of the carotenoids that they consume in their diet. And the best source, the most ready source of astaxanthin in our diet is from wild salmon. So if you think about that, you know, really distinctive, beautiful orange red color of a wild sockeye salmon, that comes from astaxanthin that works its way up into the salmon f through their diet. Right. So I know um, I want to talk more about the salmon because I think it's really interesting and, and kind of captures you know the importance of astaxanthin really in, uh, in, a, in a unique way but I, you know people also point to like you know shrimp and lobster but that's it's really found in the shells which we don't obviously consume right. at least most of us don't um so that's why you really can't get the benefit of astaxanthin from those foods. Is that is that fair? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. So most so crustaceans do contain astaxanthin. It's primarily found in the in the shell. And if you've ever seen you know a lobster say in the ocean, it's actually this kind of greenish brown or blue greenish blue color and that's yeah. because the astaxanthin is bent by a protein in the shell called crustocyanin and then when you cook the lobster the protein unfolds releases the astaxanthin and it reveals its true you know red color but of course we don't Absolutely. we don't eat the shell so that's not really a good source in our diet for astaxanthin right. unfortunately uh, yeah no absolutely <laughs> otherwise you know pretty tasty yeah um so um, let's talk more about the salmon because, again, it's just not there to make make the salmon look pretty. Mm -mm. <laughs> you know, it actually has a really important function in the survival of the species, actually. Can you elaborate on that, please? Yeah, so that is where the research for astaxanthin really started was in aquaculture and raising salmon. So uh, Dr. Oke Lignel out of Uppsala University uh, is one of the you know founding uh, fathers, if you will, of astereal astaxanthin. And he was approached okay. by some uh, fishermen who wanted to feed their salmon a natural source of astaxanthin and so he started looking into this algae as a source of natural astaxanthin and in his research he found that this astaxanthin actually helped developing salmon grow better and survive better and thrive in fact and so astaxanthin it became clear was an essential nutrient for salmon and he also found that it actually physically binds to a protein in salmon muscle and we know that salmon are really amazing endurance athletes. During spawning season, they can migrate um, hundreds of miles. So from, for example, from Astoria, Oregon to South Central Idaho and the Snake River, that's 900 miles that they migrate with a total of 7,000 foot elevation. They can jump over rapids up to 12 feet high. And the whole time they are not eating. So what they're doing is they're relying on the fat stores in their, in their muscle to, uh, to make that, that trip, to, to provide energy for that endurance race basically that they're doing and that fat must be protected by something and the muscle tissue must be protected by something and astaxanthin uh, does play a role in that yeah so we talked about free radicals a little bit already but one of the act you know one of the activities 
that produces a lot of free radicals is physical activity. Your muscles, a byproduct of all that activity is free radicals are, I guess, created. Mm -hmm. And I assume that's sort of the key mechanism how astaxanthin is helping the salmon swim upstream up to 900 miles, jump over these six foot rapids and mm -hmm. all to give birth and you know, hopefully the spe allow the species to survive essentially, right? So is that, is that more or less what's happening? That's right. So as we put more demand on muscles, they need to produce more energy to meet the requirements of the physical activity. So exercise ramps up mitochondrial energy production. And because, you know, mitochondria, the, the powerhouse of the cell, they're like little engines and no engine is 100% efficient. They end up producing free radicals as a byproduct of that energy production process. And as you increase the activity of the mitochondria, you also increase production of free radicals. And so this can increase the amount of damage to muscle tissue, which affects athletic performance and would, of course, affect uh, the salmon's migration as well. And we've seen in exercising mice and um, that this this physical damage, this oxidative damage to the muscle accumulates when they exercise. But when we supplemented these mice with astaxanthin, the amount of oxidative damage in the muscle of exercising mice was significantly reduced. So this is how one of the primary mechanisms is it's able to quench free radicals and you know minimize the amount of oxidative damage that's occurring in the muscle tissue during exercise. And we'll get into it in a bit, but you've also been able to show in humans it can help yes with muscle you know endurance and sustainable energy and all that so yes um, in both trained and untrained mm -hmm. humans as yeah. well as uh, young and older individuals as well exactly exactly now I definitely want to explore that a little bit more so but let's just talk about so salmon really is one of the only games in town if you will to get astaxanthin to diet right um and salmon just an awesome food um great protein great omega-3 um content you know yeah. relatively little omega-6s at least in the uh the wild salmon um and then obviously you have astaxanthin um but realistically we don't eat enough salmon to get adequate astaxanthin um you know throughout the course of you know a year month whatever it may be is that is that is that accurate? Right. And, and anyway, it's true. But especially if you're vegetarian or vegan, you're not even accessing mm. that source. So in contrast mm. to other carotenoids like beta carotene from carrots or lutein and zeaxanthin from leafy greens or lycopene from tomatoes, you know, most of our carotenoids come from fruits and vegetables in our diet. <laughs> but there are no plants edible plants in our diet that contain astaxanthin. And so the only source is from red colored seafoods and really, really just wild salmon. And so based on the average intake, the average American consumes about two pounds of salmon a year. Now let's make the assumption that that's all wild sockeye salmon, which of course right. we know it isn't, but assuming that it is, that would amount to 11 milligrams of astaxanthin for the whole year, whereas we recommend 12 milligrams a day as kind of the, the best or uh, highest dose that you would get the most benefits from. And, you know, and folks, at the outset, I said it is one of the challenges with astaxanthin, get, you know, it's a great candidate for a supplement, and I didn't even consider the vegan aspect of it, but that's right. true if you're a vegetarian or you don't eat seafood. Um, but, you know, 11 milligrams you know, a year is probably not going to cut it. I think, as we'll see, you probably need three to twelve milligrams a day, really, to get the full benefits of of astaxanthin. Is that, right. is that fair? That's right. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, um, so you know, oh, before we leave the salmon thing, because this thing bugs me a little bit. Um, <laughs> you know, obviously, a wild salmon has this beautiful flesh, right? There's nothing like when you, you know, if you eat salmon, nothing like you know that fresh salmon. Um, the farm salmon, they cheat a little bit to get that color. Do they not? <laughs> Do they not? <laughs> right, right. Because obviously, you know, um, the salmon is getting the astaxanthin through its wild diet, to its mm -hmm. diet, you know, in, in, in uh, marine, eating marine life. With the farm salmon, that's not the case. But um, 
how so how to get that orange flesh or somewhat orange flesh yeah. from the farm salmon. So the farm salmon are fed pellets, and what what they what the aquaculturists or uh, fish farmers basically found was that if they didn't include astaxanthin in those fish pellets, the salmon turned out this like grayish color, which obviously is rather unappealing. <laughs> and so the astaxanthin needs to be there to produce uh, the color. But also, as we discussed, it, it is very important for salmon's development as well and growth. Uh, so it is an important nutrient, not just for providing the color, but that's kind of where it started. So what they feed uh, ast what they feed the salmon there is a synthetic form of astaxanthin made from petrochemicals that has not as great an antioxidant capacity and a lot of different what are known as stereoisomers, which means the molecule comes in different shapes. Uh, we, we know that natural astaxanthin is at least 20 to 50 times stronger in terms of antioxidant capacity compared to the synthetic astaxanthin. And that's what all the studies, all the clinical studies were done on natural astaxanthin uh, from algae. And that's the key point I want to get across. Um, unfortunately, you're not getting natural astaxanthin in that farmed salmon. And I'm not saying don't eat farm salmon. I mean, it's a good protein source and, you know, has some good attributes, but you're not going to be, unfortunately, you're not going to be getting the benefits of the natural astaxanthin that we're seeking, um, you know, to help our bodies, uh, or that we know can help our bodies through, through the past research. Um, so, Karen, let's now kind of start exploring some of the actual benefits that we've seen from supplementing with natural astaxanthin and, and asteroid astaxanthin, obviously included in that. Um, one of my favorite benefits of taking astaxanthin personally is how it really helps my eyes you know, relieve eye fatigue, eye strain, um, which, regardless of your age, um, is a challenge, right? Because we spend so much time now in front of digital devices, right? I mean, you can't, you know, you know, most people can't go 15 minutes without looking at their phones, right, or whatever. Right. Um, and that really creates a lot of challenges for our eye muscles. Um, so can you can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So we know that astaxanthin crosses the blood retinal barrier and is found in eyes. And in particular, it's been found in the front of the eye, in some muscles that frame the lens. They're called the ciliary muscles. And these muscles are in charge of changing the shape of the lens. So the reason that's important is because that's part of what mediates dynamic focus. And when you're focused on a screen that's very close to you, um, 20 feet or closer, those muscles contract to round out the lens and change the focal point so you can actually see that screen or book or cross stitch or whatever soldering that you're doing. And so uh, those muscles just stay contracted in the case of you know, digital devices. We tend to use them for hours on end and those muscles get tired staying contracted for such long periods of time. Exactly. So that's a question of uh, endurance and muscle recovery. And because astaxanthin works in those muscles at the front of the eye, you know, similar to what we spoke about in salmon, uh, astaxanthin helps to quench those free radicals, helps to promote endurance of muscle and muscle recovery. And in clinical studies, over 16 of them, we've seen that astaxanthin helps to improve this dynamic focus function, which is called accommodation. And it also helps to alleviate subjective symptoms of eye strain and eye fatigue that result from computer use, prolonged computer use. Yeah. I mean, I saw a stat recently that you know, it seems like the average adult is now spending like 12, 13 hours a day in front of screens. Yeah, right? I saw that I mean, stat too. It's wild. It's that was during the pandemic. It went up from nine and a half hours to something like 13 hours um, right. Yeah. And there's probably no going back because of, you know, just, you know, just how addicted we get to these devices. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of starting a new game, right? You have to guess, I give you a, a real world situation. You have to guess how many people are looking at their phones. So example, six people at a red light. How many Karen people were looking at their phones <laughs> at the red light? <laughs> it's just, we're constantly looking at these things and it just yeah. puts a lot of pressure um, on those ciliary muscles. Like, again, just to bring that home, what you're saying is, the lens in the outer part of the eye, it flexes, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at something across the room or in the distance, that lens flattens. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's very easy for the ciliary muscle. It's in a relaxed state very easy, right? Exactly. But 
when I start looking at my phone, or look at my computer screen, something very close, those muscles now have to take that lens and basically round it out, bend it, if you will, almost a spherical type of shape mm -hmm. so I can really focus on what I'm looking at up close. And that's where the challenge comes in. That's where the muscles get tired, free radicals are kind of, you know, being generated. And that's where astaxanthin comes in to help, help, you know, help relieve um, and help mop up those free radicals and also help just I, my muscles sustain their energy levels. Is, is that kind of about right? That's a great description. And it's not the only be be benefit of astaxanthin for eyes. Astaxanthin also has benefits for blood flow to the back of the eye. So we've seen an increase between 9 and 11% in retinal blood flow, which helps to nourish uh, the eye and remove metabolic waste. And that's especially significant as we age, you know, starting a 50 plus, uh, the efficiency of blood flow tends to change and become less. And so astaxanthin is there in a number of ways to help with uh, blood flow or blood rheology and neutrify the, the eye as well as other tissues. No, absolutely. It's a great thing. The other challenge with the lens too, <laughs> speaking of people over 50, um, that lens becomes more rigid over time, I think, right? Mm -hmm. So it becomes the cilia will have to work that much harder to kind of round it out, which, you know, again, just, you know, shows why you need extra support. And astaxanthin is one of, I think, the best nutrients out there to do that. So, um, so that's really exciting stuff. Um, let's talk about, on the subject of muscles. Let's talk about, you know, just we touched on it before when we talked about the salmon. But in terms of endurance and physical activity and maybe just, you know, every day getting around doing things, how can astaxanthin support our muscle health? Yeah, so as we discussed, exercise does ramp up our free radical production, and this can lead to an extra or additional source of muscle damage. So in addition to the mechanical force that you're placing on muscles, that you know wave of free radical production can add to that muscle damage. And we have studies showing, for example, in soccer players supplementing with astaxanthin, that we were able to significantly reduce um, muscle damage markers, creatine kind and aspartate aminotransferase in these soccer players as they were going uh, about of exercise. So now uh, we know that astaxanthin helps to support muscles during exercise, reducing those muscle damage markers, but we also see in cyclists that it that helps to support muscle performance as well and helps those mitochondria continue to use a more efficient energy source uh, which is fat. So if we compare uh, you know, fat and carbohydrates as energy sources, uh, maybe you know that carbohydrates are a really great quick energy source. Uh, you know, we can burn them in the mitochondria or outside the mitochondria, but if we're talking about in the mitochondria, uh, we get six times more energy in the form of ATP from yeah. one gram of fat compared to one gram of carbohydrate. So the, the energy source that's more efficient, that's going to help us with endurance exercise or energy management is going to be using fat for energy. And uh, we see in a recent study in cyclists that after 40 kilometers of riding, which is a, a lot of riding, uh, they did end up using more fat for energy, uh, which is a, 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 an evidence that supports that you have better endurance. And in another study in cyclists that did a 20 kilometer time trial, they were able to shave two minutes off their time to complete the trial. And they also increased their power output on the bicycle by 20 watts, which shows that this can actually improve your athletic performance. Now, I know that not all of us are uh, that accomplished athletes. And so there, there are other studies that show astaxanthin helps to affect uh, subjective symptoms of mental and physical fatigue in untrained individuals in response to, you know, mild cycling and a little bit of mental math that might get you a bit tired. And there's also a really nice study from the University of Washington that explored individuals between the ages of 65 and 85 who are having a bit more trouble getting gains from any kind of exercise they may be doing. You know, as we 
age, the way that we metabolize protein, the, the blood flow, the antioxidant capacity, all are affected in ways that influence, negatively influence our ability to adapt to exercise. And this study showed that when these individuals combined exercise training together with astaxanthin, they were able to see significant gains in muscle strength and muscle cross-sectional area and also in muscle quality that the individuals who were just doing the exercise by itself without supplementation didn't see any really significant gains there. So there's a lot of potential there, uh, not just for trained athletes, but also for the everyday you know, individual who's trying to um, stay active and live a healthy lifestyle and support as we age as well. No, absolutely. I mean, again, it's again, like with the, with the eye health, right? It really does span, you know, ages, age groups and, you know, people in different, you know, different stages of, you know, activity. I mean, it's really interesting what you mentioned at the end that just related to the age related muscle loss. I mean, I think it's after age 40, you start losing about 1% of your muscle a year or something. Even like earlier, it's in your thirties. It starts. Is it? Yes. Oh my goodness. I know. Wow. <laughs> well, and, but I think that unfortunately starts to accelerate, you know, once you get to your sixties, seventies, et cetera, a little bit. So again, you know, you don't have to be a trained, like you said, a trained cyclist or a marathon runner to really experience the mus muscle, you know, no, <clears throat> it's not just an endurance thing. It's maintenance of muscle, right? Isn't it? Um, right. You know, um, you know, if you're just experiencing a natural, muscle loss that comes with, you know, getting a little older, um, then astaxanthin can make a big difference. In, uh, and that's really important because, you know, you start talking about issues like frailty and, you know, it can, it can really cause um, significant problems as you get old and you start losing uh, more muscle than you really would like to. So, all right, look, I want to um, keep moving here because there's so much to talk about. Um, so not only can astaxanthin help us on the inside, but our appearance can benefit from as taking astaxanthin as a supplement. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think people love this benefit of astaxanthin. Of course, you know, it's important to be able to feel good, but whenever you can uh, see some kind of effect as well, that certainly uh, is, is a nice uh, bonus. And we know that astaxanthin does reach skin, which is, I think, the benefit that you're referring to, and uh, from ingestion. So it's a, it's a real beauty from within nutrient, and uh, it helps to support hydration, elasticity, Elasticity and smoothness, and that's by providing antioxidant benefits, but also astaxanthin has anti-inflammatory properties. And so one study looked at how seasonal changes affect skin. Uh, and you know, in this particular study, the supplementation began in the summer and then continued through into winter and December. And during that time, humidity goes down and low humidity does trigger inflammation. And it's interesting that all of this happens at the surface, but those inflammation markers travel down and communicate to those deeper layers of skin in the dermis where collagen is produced. And yeah. uh, this actually uh, increases expression of collagen degrading enzymes called matrix metalloproteases, or you can think of them as scissor enzymes, let's say, that cut up the collagen network. And this is what leads to wrinkles. And that's what they found in the placebo group was a, a significant increase over the course of that 16 week trial in average uh, wrinkle depth in the skin. Yeah. But the astaxanthin groups at 6 milligrams and 12 milligrams saw no significant changes in those that wrinkle measure. So astaxanthin was able to maintain skin condition even through those seasonal changes. And we have numerous studies that show astaxanthin uh, in other studies slowed evaporation of water through the skin, so helping to support that skin barrier function to keep our yeah. skin hydrated, which is you know so important. Uh, I think a lot of people like to use the term glow, right, to keep that skin glowing and looking uh, looking healthy. Well, it's, you know, it's really interesting, um, the whole collagen aspect of it, because, um, you know, again, picking up on something we were discussing earlier, if you are following a vegan lifestyle, um, you know, collagen peptides really aren't something you could ingest or 
would like to ingest because um, they're generally animal sourced, right? So, you know, so I'm not saying astaxanthin is a replacement for that, but it can, you know, can help you protect the collagen you do have. Yeah. Um, so it may be, that's, a, that's another interesting fact I hadn't considered. So, yeah, it's uh, like putting bubble wrap around your collagen producing cells and the collagen network itself. So there is, you know, we, of course, we have 70 plus human clinical studies on asteril astaxanthin, but those preclinical studies that are done in cells or uh, those can give you some insight into mechanism of action. And so we have sure. this really lovely uh, study that was done in human skin cell fibroblasts in a dish that were exposed to free radicals. And what we found was that those cells didn't survive uh, and also, you know, they didn't, they stopped producing collagen because they didn't survive. But astaxanthin pretreatment of those cells really helped the cells survive quite a lot, more than 90% survival uh, to that exposure to free radicals and retained 80% of baseline collagen production. So mm. it's important to protect your existing collagen, but also your capacity to produce collagen by protecting those skin cell fibroblasts. And based on those studies, it seems that astaxanthin is able to do that. Interesting. So look, and I wasn't saying only take astaxanthin for skin health if you're a vegan. I mean, even if you are ingesting collagen, please do, because it's, it's gonna support, it's gonna work differently, right? Um, or in some ways the same, I guess. But um, it's the that's really interesting. Yeah, it's, that's I think right. it's like that's collagen right. plus, you know, you take it, your yeah, astaxanthin. Exactly, yeah. uh, exactly. You know, so um, just transitioning a little, you know, one of the things I've started to notice, I'm not a scientist, but, you know, I noticed that a lot of nutrients that benefit the eyes also benefit our brain health, mm -hmm. right? Which is, you know, not surprising, right? They're connected. Basically, <laughs> yeah, they're connected. Um, you know, obviously lutein, zeaxanthin, um, and I know recently, I mean, I don't know if it's an emerging area or not, or it's, you know, but certainly seems to gain a little more attention, is astaxanthin and, and cognitive function, brain health. Uh, what, what's going on there of interest in your mind? Yeah, it's a really interesting area, of course, because the brain is just chock full of polyunsaturated fats. That's why we love our omegas, polyunsaturated fatty acids, to support brain health. I think something like 20% of the dry weight of the brain is made up of these very sensitive lipids that we want to protect. Yeah. Also, blood flow is super important to supporting uh, this very metabolically active organ, especially, I mean, always, but also as we age and that blood flow is not as efficient. So astaxanthin is able to support through its antioxidant activity, through its anti-inflammatory properties, which we've seen in vitro, it helps to protect neurons from oxidative stress and also uh, from um, a, a stressor that causes inflammation in vitro. But also in human clinical studies, we've seen that astaxanthin helps to improve cognitive performance. So there was one study in particular where individuals were supplementing with 12 milligrams a day, a natural astaxanthin, and they were asked to do various computer tests with uh, card games, basically. It's called the Cog Health uh, uh, test and uh, okay. they performed 7% better in their reaction time to a working memory task and also improved their accuracy in a delayed recall task. So helping to support cognitive uh, function based on this study. And there was another study also I mentioned earlier, it would combine 12 milligrams of astral astaxanthin with uh, tocopherols, which is uh, vitamin E. And in that study, the uh, participants performed better in a mental math exercise, making fewer mistakes in the second round, meaning they were less tired and making fewer errors. Uh, but also they reported improvements in subjective symptoms of mental fatigue, overall fatigue, physical fatigue, even in some aspects of mood related to irritation and friendliness, things like that. So. Yeah. Interesting. Now, that's going to be just a, such a great area to, to keep following. You know, you've been so generous, generous with your time today, Karen. So really, My really pleasure. appreciate it. Uh, one of the things I get asked a lot, and I'm really curious of your, your perspective, is people say, well, how much acid should I take a day? Right. And, you know, when do I take it? Um, and that type of thing. And then maybe um, 
as a you know tangent to that, maybe we'll want to talk a little bit about Asta Real and why. Um, you know, I certainly believe you're the premier producer in the world, and you know what you do that might be a little unique, or, or that you know you feel give you the best product that's really out there. So I'll answer the dosage question first. So we do have studies showing benefits from between two to 12 milligrams. So you can get uh, antioxidant benefits as low as two milligrams, and it really just depends on your goal. We do see some dose-dependent effects, meaning that the more you take, the more benefits you'll achieve from it in some cases. And that's all because, you know, again, we're trying to reach a balance. So where are you in that uh, free radical antioxidant balance, you know, uh, you may see see more of a benefit from a higher higher dose if mm -hmm. your free radical load is higher and your antioxidant capacity is lower. But we have seen in a general population two milligrams a day is enough to actually produce some antioxidant benefits, whereas at three to four milligrams a day, you start to see some skin benefits. And in between four to six, you see benefits for eye health. And then six to 12, oh, sorry, four to six also benefits for muscle as well. And then six to 12, we have additional benefits for cardiovascular health, cognitive health, and some new studies showing benefits uh, for muscle health at 12 milligrams as well. So I would say, you know, uh, you're going to see benefits at the lower doses, but if it's possible for you to take, you know, a six to 12 milligram dose, um, that's what I would recommend personally. And uh, definitely because if you're taking a little tiny soft gel, remember it's fat soluble. So please take it together with a meal or within 30 minutes after a meal to prime your gut for absorption of a fat soluble nutrient like astaxanthin. Yeah. And then when you're thinking about which astaxanthin supplement to take, I of course encourage you to take Astoreal astaxanthin because we were first to market with astaxanthin for uh, human supplementation uh, back in the 80s. And uh, we have had all that time to really build the foundation for safety and efficacy of this ingredient. So we have over 40 safety studies, over 70 human clinical studies showing efficacy. And the way that we grow our algae is unique. So algae, they're little sponges. Whatever they're exposed to in the water, in the air, they're going Going to absorb it and some of those things may actually co-purify with the astaxanthin upon extraction. So what we've done at Astreal is we've created this really elegant and proprietary cultivation system that's uh, we have one system in Washington State and another in Sweden and we grow all of our algae indoors in what are known as closed photobioreactors. Growing them indoors allows us to control the environment and really nurture the algae to make sure they're always getting all the nutrients they need, all the light they need. We filter out any persistent chemical pollutants that are, you know, can cause some health concerns out of the air so they never get into our algae at detectable levels. And that makes our products higher quality. Providing consistent conditions also means we just let the algae tell us when they're mature and ready and have made as much astaxanthin as they're able to make. And we only harvest fully mature red phase algae. And that's in contrast to the conventional way of growing algae, which is outside, uh, which means you're using sunlight, which is great and works. And that's what's used in nature, but it's also an can be an inconsistent environment for these algae to grow. Outdoor cultivation sometimes means higher risk of biological and chemical contamination because you cannot filter the air and other organisms may see that yummy media that the algae are growing in and want a piece of that. And so by necessity, you may have to harvest them a little early just to beat those little competing uh, biological contaminants that are growing together with your algae. So that means the algae aren't mature. They may still have some of that green chlorophyll in there, and that's what's generating the free radicals and compromising astaxanthin stability. So you really want to wait it out. Let the algae grow. Let them break down all that green chlorophyll and make as much astaxanthin as they could possibly make before you harvest them, and growing indoors allows us to do that. You know, very well said. I mean, there's a lot of detail, but it's very important detail because, you know, you, if you're going to take a supplement, you want the best supplement you can you can take, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why in our True Asta product, our uh, 
What you asked to hear, we have every soft gel, six milligrams um, of Astoreal Astaxanthin. Um, as Karen mentioned, you know, for eye health, muscle endurance, skin health, you know, probably taking one soft gel, getting six milligrams a day is probably adequate. If you're interested in the cognitive health and brain health benefits of Astoreal Astaxanthin, then maybe you want to consider taking two, two milligrams, two, I'm sorry, two soft gels a day to get 12 milligrams. Mm -hmm. so, um, so just to recap here quickly, um, Astaxanthin, one of nature's most powerful antioxidants, that's not only powerful but very versatile, which is very important. It makes it very valuable to your body. Um, hard to get from diet alone, which is why uh, we recommend using Astoreal Astaxanthin, 6 to 12 milligrams. Um, and finally, um, some of the benefits you can you can potentially experience, helping with eye fatigue and eye strain, muscle endurance, um, but also helping preserve muscle as you age. Uh, skin health, you know, helping... You know, all the age-related issues we face with skin, um, whether it be just the glow and wrinkles and just overall appearance and skin elasticity, very important. And finally, um, there's obviously um, some really great emerging benefits for your brain health and cognitive health. And we didn't even really have a chance to talk on the, the cardiovascular and heart health side, but oh as we mentioned, um, Astaxanthin promotes blood flow um, throughout, which of course is gonna be good for your heart and cardiovascular system. So Karen, You've been, again, very, very generous and very informative. I'm sure all the viewers are really enjoying this. Um, what's the best way uh, people can get in touch with you if they want to follow you or learn more? Absolutely. Well, you're you're so knowledgeable, Carl, and uh, the Nature City website is such an amazing resource with such a great wealth of information. So I always, I always point people to that website <laughs> when they want to <laughs> learn more about us. The same thing. But you can certainly also visit AstorealUSA.com, uh, where we have some information, and also Astaxanthin.net, where we'll also be doing some consumer education on uh, Astaxanthin, um, the studies, the uses, uh, and uh, you can uh, reach out via AstorealUSA.com if you like. Uh, we do have some question forms there. and. If you have questions for me, I'm, I'm happy to answer them uh, by that platform. So thank you. That's terrific. And we will include for our, our viewers um, on YouTube or listening um, on after the podcast, we will have um, in the show notes some of these links that Karen is referring to. And if you want to see uh, the Nature City website or the Ask the Real websites, uh, those will be available to you. Karen, um, as always, a pleasure, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Carl. It's, it's such a pleasure to be a guest on your program. I really appreciate your having me here. Thank you. Our pleasure, and that's it for this week's episode, so we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.